Hey everybody, Shabbat Shalom from Israel. I want to continue with uh, what I started yesterday talking about the uh, ICSJ, that is the International Court of Supposed Justice. It's an actual kangaroo court if they actually uh, received the testimony yesterday from the South African Committee because it was um, it was one-sided, um, completely one-sided, just ridiculously one-sided. And we're going to get into some of those points in a minute. I've got 15 points I want to make. But first, I want to say something about genocide because it's a very serious charge. It's a really serious charge. As, as a member of a race that has been the victim of attempted genocide 53 times in history, you can go back to, to Haman. You can go back to Pharaoh with the babies in Egypt. You can go back to the New Testament when uh, the little baby boys were killed by Herod. Um, you can go to the Holocaust. You can go, sadly, into church history, um, into different pogroms, and into Ukraine in the, uh, uh, several hundred years ago with uh, Chemelnitsky, where they killed 100,000 to 500,000 Jewish people, um, into the Crusades, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we understand genocide. If there's any one group of people, more than any other group of people in the world, that understands what genocide is and isn't, it is definitely the Jewish people, and those who know our history. But genocide is when you seek to destroy another ethnic group completely, wipe them off the face of the earth. It's happened uh, all throughout history, and we have an example of it in, our, in, in modern history. We have several examples, but the greatest and the most severe example of genocide was the Holocaust, of course. And um, here's what I want you to understand about that. Let's just ask a question. What could the Jewish people have done to stop Hitler? And, and I'll just to save time, the answer is nothing. They couldn't have paid him off. They, they could not have surrendered. They could not have taken arms again. There, there's nothing that they could have done to stop Hitler. He was, I want to say hellbent. Am I allowed to say that? He was hellbent on killing the Jewish people. Every Jew in Europe, 9.5 million Jews in Europe, he killed six million of them. And th that's genocide. That is the very definition of genocide. What is going on in Gaza is not that for several reasons. Because number one, it could stop tonight. If Hamas would go and make an announcement and right now and say, we are laying down our arms, we are surrendering, and we are giving up the 135 plus or minus, Israeli hostages, the, the hostilities would stop immediately. So it can't be genocide because Israel's motivation is not to destroy the Palestinian ethnicity. By the way, there's no such thing as Palestinian ethnicity, unless you want to call me a Palestinian or anyone who's lived here in um, what was an area that was dubbed Palestine in 132 by uh, Emperor Hadrian. By the way, not an Arab, not a Muslim, many hundreds of years before Islam. And he was the Roman emperor, and he borrowed that name from the ancient Philistines to... By the way, that was genocide. That was ethnic cleansing. When in 130 to 135, there was a war between Rome and Israel, and he deported as many Jews as he possibly could from Israel and, and killed a lot of Jews here and changed the name. Ethnic cleansing, genocide, that that's what it is. But that's not what's going on in Gaza. Again, number one, they could surrender right now, release the hostages, and the hostilities would end. It is not our goal to get rid of Gaza. And it should not be to get rid of the people of Gaza. It should not be according to Torah. Every human being is made in the image of God. That includes the Hamas fighters. Now, they've given themselves over to demons, and we have a responsibility to protect our people, but I would love for them to surrender, to repent, to, to see the light and understand that God, Allah, God, by the way, the, the word Allah was a strange thing for me that I, I realized when I began to go to minister in Africa, that in many African dialects, believers refer to God as Allah. It simply means God. Uh, Elohim, God. Um, but their version of the one true God is perverted completely because God does not want them to rape 
teenage girls. God does not want them to murder people in cold blood, to shoot them in the head, to stab them in the back. God does not want them to burn people of life. But because they believe that and because th- that Israel has a, a right, but more than that, a responsibility to protect his people. So that's what's happening in Gaza. If we wanted genocide, that could have been taken care of very quickly. We, we have the firepower and we have gone to such lengths to minimize civilian casualties. You saw me say, well, then why is there so many? Because Hamas hides behind them. They, you have to understand this. I might be getting into my point. Um, Hamas does not care when Palestinian people die. You have to understand. They do not care. Not only do they do not care, they like it. They want it. It is wonderful for them because it's propaganda. They believe, and I'm, I'm, I'm now paraphrasing a quote from one of the billionaire leaders of Hamas, and that he says that the blood of the Palestinians belongs to them for the sake of the revolution. In other words, it's their duty to spill their blood. No, buddy, it's your duty to spill your blood for them. That's what leaders do. But you see, that's the difference between Hamas and the IDF. And this, this isn't even in my notes, but I just need to tell you, Acharai. Say it with me, everybody together. Acharai. What does that mean? Literally, it means after me. But, it, but in English, it's like, follow me. That is what Israeli commanders say when they go into battle. It is the ethos of the Israeli army. Follow me, Acharai. When we go into battle, the, the commanders say to the privates and, and, and those younger than them, follow me, come after me, I'm going first. And, and a lot of people criticize that because we have lost a lot of commanders. You need your commanders, but I think it's one of the reasons that we have one of the most ethical armies on earth. Now, let's compare that to Hamas. They don't say, follow me. They say, go, die. I'm going to be in my tunnel. I'm going to be in my million-dollar mansion. You go and die. Spill your blood for the Palestinian people. Meanwhile, I'm going to... Sinwar, the leader of the people Hamas, has surrounded himself with hostages. What a coward. What a loser. Can I say that? Can I say that? I mean, honestly, this guy is a horrible human being. Not for, Forget anything else I might say about him. He does not love his own people. The people that he claims to represent, he's sending them to die. He invites the Israeli army to... They booby trap... I'm getting into my notes. So let's go through our point. So I said all that to say that not genocide. Genocide, now you might disagree with what Israel is doing in Gaza. It's still not genocide. You can say that we're, we're going, you're going too far, too many, de- okay, we can have that argument. Still not genocide. Genocide is when you try and destroy an entire ethnic group of people, which we have the means and the power to do, and we've had it for a long time, and we don't do it because we'd never think of it. It would never, like, God forbid. Okay, number one, and I was, I, I'm, I am, I've got most of these points from watching, and I would encourage you to watch. Um, there were, there were the first guy to speak, and the third woman. Well, let me say it this way: the first person and the third person. The first person was a man. The third person was a woman. She may have been the third or fourth. There, it's only about a half hour each of them, and you can watch them double speed. And go watch them because they were fantastic. All the other folks were more. It was more legalese. So it was a two pronged approach. Approach. It was number one: let me fight from common sense, which is what I try and do here. Uh, as an advocate for Israel is simply to lay out the facts, but in a court of law, they might say, so what? That doesn't make sense. So we had other folks who were international experts in the the legality of the International Court of Justice, and they uh, were advocates for Israel, but you would not find them as interesting. And I don't say that to make light of you or your intelligence because I didn't find them that interesting. It was good what they were doing and they have to do that because the, again, you're, you're, you're before the International Court of Justice and you have to, you know, quote Article 6.2, blah, 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 in order to make your argument. By the way, when you watch it, and I hope you go watch it, take notice of the, the female 
uh, lawyer for uh, South Africa. I, 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 by her last name, I assume she's Muslim. She could not have been a bit more disinterested in what we had to say. Now, the, the main lawyer, who is a, uh, a huge critic of Israel, and, and I'm not saying that I like him in any ways or what he stands for. I have to give him credit because for several hours, he, whether he was listening or not, I don't know, but he gave his full attention. But it seemed like most of the other guys, they were just like playing with their phones and, and bored. But then again, they're not the ones who will make the, the judgment. It will be the ju justices. Okay, so number one, I did, I did not know this, but on so October the 7th, uh, the South African government issues an official statement saying that the hostilities that were taking place on October 7th were the fault of Israel. So the reason that Hamas came in and raped teenagers was because of Israel. Israel it's Israel's fault that they did that. The reason that Hamas plunged a knife in the back of a young girl who resisted being raped is because of Israel. The reason Hamas shot people in the head and, and burned house down, houses down and burned people alive and took people captive, it's all Israel's fault. They, they, on October 7th, before we responded, before there was any bombing, before the IDF had even time to think, they had already determined that Hamas's attempted genocide against the southern communities of Israel, and, and that's what it was. I said this yesterday. You say, Ron, you can't call what Hamas did genocide because they, they, they only killed 1,200 people and there's 7 million Jews in Israel. Yes, I can. I'll tell you why. Because that's what they were trying to do. If they had the ability to kill every Jew, and by the way, their own leaders, has, when one of their main leaders went on TV shortly after and said, yeah, well, we're, we don't regret it. We're going to do it again and again and again. There's going to be a time for October 7th, October 10th, and you know November. They want to keep doing this because they genocide is their goal. How ironic that South Africa is accusing the victims of an attempted genocide of, of being the perpetrators of genocide. But they went out, they made that conclusion, South Africa, on um, October 7th, while, while there were still terrorists inside of Israel killing people. Number two, uh, and I already said number two, Hamas leaders said that they would do it again and again and again. And uh, number three, I've already said too, which is Hamas is in itself a genocidal uh organization. They want to commit genocide. And, and honestly, they commit genocide against their own people by sacrificing them for the sake of their Islamic goals. Number four, I did not know this until today. South Africa has formal relationships with Hamas. And either, even after October 7th, celebrated what they did, invited them to South Africa. Now, again, I don't have documentation of this. I'm repeating what the lawyer said. Go watch the first session of, of the court this morning. I was kind of stunned by that. I mean, there, there is a um, website. I'm going to tell it to you right now because uh, Israel just, and again, we're so bad at this in Israel. I, I hate to say this, um, but when it comes to what we call in Israel, uh, hang on. Let's see if I can find it. Hang on just a second. I'm going to find it because you need to see it. And don't stop watching. But we're not very good at Hasbara. Hasbara is, is uh, advocacy. We're, we're, we're lazy. We're slow. Meanwhile, the, the Palestinians are really, really good at it. I mean, they are mobilized all over the world. But we put out a website today, and it's called this. Are you ready? Saturday-October-7.com. You get that? Saturday-October-7.com. Now, what's interesting is I can't view that website here in Israel. They have blocked it here in Israel because uh, probably out of respect of the victims, they don't want those pictures being shown in Israel. But in other nations, you can view that. And most of you are watching from other nations. And you can see some of the footage, some of the videos, some of the pictures that I was able to see when I watched the 45 minutes of Hamas atrocities. So um, I want you to go there if you don't mind. Um, but yeah, while those things were happening, some of the things that you'll see on that website, while that was happening, 
South Africa was already defending Hamas. After they knew what had happened, after they heard the reports of teenagers being raped, after they, and again, I said this yesterday, I, I, I don't want to say who my source is, and I won't say who my, my source is, uh, but I have been told by somebody who knows that there are girls and women who came back from captivity pregnant from terrorists raping them. We, we believe that right now that there are girls or women in captivity right now who are probably pregnant that f from being raped. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? South Africa? Can you imagine that one of your citizens, a young girl, 19 years old, is now being held by a terrorist and a baby is growing in her stomach from that terrorist? Uh, 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 imagine that. That's what you're defending, South Africa. And by the way, I mean the government of South Africa. I know that there are many people in South Africa who find what their government is doing reprehensible right now. Number five. When Israel left Gaza in 2005, you, you know this story? You know, I, I had somebody uh, write on Instagram today something about... Uh, me having a low IQ and something about us being in Gaza. You're in Gaza, but you stole land, blah, blah. I'm like, um, actually, we left Gaza in 2005. So I don't want to get into the whole history like we did yesterday, but from 1948 to 1967, nearly 20 years, Egypt controlled Gaza. And it was like a prison. It was, you know, people didn't have passports. They didn't have citizenship. They didn't have freedoms. We liberated Gaza in 1967. And if not for the fact that a few years later they were stirred up against us by the PLO, we could be living in peace today. We've never annexed Gaza. We've never said Gaza is a part of Israel. But we did have communities in Gaza. We had Jewish people living in Gaza, about 10,000. And in 2005, we left. We left. We said goodbye. We're leaving. You know, here's our farms. Here's our greenhouses. And, and a year later, Hamas... Uh, uh, came to power, and, and just so you know, the, the, their their enemies are not just Israel, but their enemies are the the Palestinian Authority. They threw members of the Palestinian Authority that were living in Gaza off of the roof roofs of buildings. They murdered them as they seized complete control of Gaza back in two thousand six. They never took the. They, they didn't say, "Hey, Israel, God bless you. Thank you for those." Uh, greenhouses and those um, uh, farms. We're gonna we're gonna build a society. We're gonna build an economy. We're gonna have freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of the press in Gaza. It's funny um, because if you're actually it, there's so many people in the press in Gaza that work with Hamas. By the way, if not, you, you're not gonna get a story. But some of them are actively involved. Okay, they did not take advantage of that. Um, and instead they turned it into a, a, they turned the entire region of Gaza into one of the largest terror infrastructure that the world infrastructures that the world has ever known. The, the tunnels below Gaza that has been built with your aid money, with the aid money of the UN and in, in countries all over the world, stolen from the Palestinian people, is hundreds of kilometers long. I have heard it said that it is larger than the New York City subway system. It benefits the people of Gaza zero. They get nothing from it. It is all for the terrorists to wage war against Israel. And that's where they're hiding right now. While the people are trying to survive, the, the, the Hamas leaders are underground. Number six. See, we're moving pretty fast. I'm going to skip number six because we've pretty much covered it. Number seven. Um, so normally in cases of genocide, let's take the case of Myanmar, formerly Burma. And uh, I, can, I, I never know if I say this right, but the Rohingya Muslims who were victims of genocide in Myanmar. Um, take the Jews of Europe, okay? In the case of genocide, the, the victims typically don't have weapons, right? They're not fighting, but they're running for their lives. They're being murdered. Their ethnicity is being, there. it's an existential threat to their ethnicity, okay? In this case, Hamas 
has hundreds of thousands of rockets that they have fired at Israel for the past 20 years. That's not genocide. (laughs) They have provoked what is happening in Gaza. It would not be happening. So let's just pretend that for the past 20 years, since we left Gaza in 2005, they did not send hundreds of thousands of rockets into Israel's population center. We wouldn't be there. Let's suppose, in fact, if just October that we tolerated it, we're like, you know what? You know, only a few Israelis are dying. Um, we'll, we'll just live with it because it's not worth going into Gaza and risking the lives of our soldiers, not to mention seeing how many innocent people will die because Hamas is hi- hiding under the skirts of grandmothers because they're cowards. So we tolerated 20 years of rockets until October the 7th. And, you know, but again, Hamas has an army. They had a trained army. That's not genocide. So again, you've never had a case of genocide where where both sides had armies and they were fighting each other. You, you, You can, again, you can say Israel is bigger and stronger and thank God we are or we wouldn't be here. We would be gone. Let's keep moving. Um... Number eight, and this is really important. And, you know, if you're watching at the any of the justices at the International Court of Supposed Justice, um, you do understand that Hamas doesn't care when Palestinians die. Uh, not only they don't care, they, they, they love it. They want it. They crave it. it. It is in their interest. Why? Because Israel responds... Palestinians die. And what's happening now? The whole world is coming to their aid. Israel is being taken before the International Court of Supposed Justice. They they love this. They do not care that grandmothers have died. They do not care that children have died. In fact, when we assassinated, uh, and technically we've not taken credit, but I'll take credit on behalf of Israel, the number two guy in Hamas, they said, hey, we'll just replace him. You know, he, he's in eternity with his virgins. I mean, what a sick, sick religion. I mean, honestly, that you get to, you rape people on earth and your reward is 72 virgins in paradise. I mean, that's messed up. That is messed up on every level. And I know not all Muslims believe that, but that's messed up. They do not care. They do not care when their own people die and they want it. They long for it. They use it as propaganda. They celebrate it. Number nine. If you, um, I already said this. Um, uh, if you listen to South Africa's pres- presentation, you would assume that Hamas is an unarmed em- entity under attack. I mean, they barely mentioned uh, Hamas in yesterday's presentation, uh, only simply to, you know, use October 7th as a defining moment. But they, they showed, they showed no pictures of weapons in baby cribs. We did show that today. They showed no uh, pictures of weapons in, um, in UN schools. Uh, uh, excuse me. I said UN schools. I don't, I meant schools. Uh, they show, which we did show today. They uh, showed no pictures of the tunnels that they use. Some of the tunnels, by the way, you can like move a, a child's bed and there's a tunnel. They, and you say, well, why would they do that? Because they want to put them in the places that you would assume they wouldn't work. By the way, they didn't show the picture of the guy with the RPG launcher walking into Shifa Hospital. They didn't show that yesterday because according to South Africa, Hamas, they're just, they're just under attack and it's so sad. In fact, they, if you saw that spoof that our, we have a version of Saturday Night Live here called uh, Eretz Neheder, a wonderful country. And they did a spoof and they're starting to do them in English. And I'm so glad because uh, they're very good and they're fu- very funny, but they've always been in Hebrew. But now we're using them as haspara, as Israeli advocacy to help people see the absurdity. That's what that's what humor is for, to see the absurdity of the Hamas position. And you have this woman from the BBC interviewing Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, and she's uh, interviewing him and he is um, complaining 
of a baby crying and her interpretation of the baby crying that he's kidnapped, by the way, it's in Israel. He, he said, the mother's not here. She's in Israel and kids keeping me up all night long. I can't sleep. And her interpretation of that is Israel causing sleep deprivation to Yahya Sinwar. Of course, it's absurd. It's humor. But, but South Africa, that, that really is their position. Their position is that everything that Hamas, again, our guy with the RPG walks into a hospital. Uh -huh. Why do you need to be in a hospital with an RPG? Ah, unless you're using the hospital as a shield so that Israel will not bomb you. Because contrary to popular belief, Israel has not bombed a hospital in Gaza. We have not. We don't. We will not. Why? In fact, we went into the Shifa hospital risking the soldiers' lives, our own soldiers' lives, and evacuated them. We brought incubators into the hospital to save babies. We, again, I know people have died and that's war and it's horrible, but it, believe me, if Israel did not go through its life-saving measures, the number would probably be five times as much. And Hamas would be celebrating it all the way to the bank. But South Africa, you would think that Yahya Senwar is just a victim. He's just, you know, poor guy, um, suffering. Okay, number 10. Did you know that one of the reasons that so many people have died is that Hamas booby traps their buildings, their apartment buildings, uh, hospitals, tunnels, um, so that they will explode when, when somebody goes in them? Uh, that's one of the reasons there's so much destruction in Gaza. Number one, they're booby-trapped and they self-implode, but also we have to protect our own soldiers. We, listen, let me remind you, there is still over a hundred hostages in Israel. We have to get them back. That is the responsibility of the IDF. It's not something they get to do. It's something that they must do. It is the responsibility of the government of Israel to get those people back. And as long as Hamas holds them, we, we have to do what we have to do. So one of the reasons there's so much destruction is that we have to destroy buildings and tunnels so that our own soldiers don't get caught in booby traps. Sorry, South Africa. So uh, number 11 uh, in our 15 points. Um, so you know that Israel has uh, uh, created these humanitarian corridors. And what we've done is we've dropped leaflets. We've made, if I remember the number today, 70,000 phone calls. There was one instance, instance where an Arabic-speaking IDF commander was on the phone with a citizen of Gaza for three hours as he evacuated buildings that were going to be targeted. We could have just explained bloated the buildings and killed all the people. Hamas would have. Let, again, let's just reverse it, South Africa. Let's pretend that Hamas had the power that we had. Let's pretend that Hamas had the the, the bombs and the, and the uh, military infrastructure that Israel has. Do you think that they would be uh, sending leaflets and making, hey, we're going to be bombing? No, they raped girls. Why in the world would they care if they killed Israel? That's their goal, to kill Israelis. But yet we risk the life of our soldiers to minimize civilian death in Gaza in our effort to get our hostages back and to destroy Hamas so October the 7th can never happen again, which again is their stated goal, that it would happen again and again and again and again. So these uh, humanitarian safe zones and uh, corridors that we've created Hamas will fire on them. They don't. By, by the way, that the number twenty three thousand. Nobody's. How many of those people have Hamas killed? They don't say. You remember the Shifa Hospital, which we were accused of targeting early on in the war. It turns out that it was the bomb from a rocket from Islamic Jihad. Now, again, just to. Remember, Fresh your memory of that story. This was what was reported on Al Jazeera, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 15 minutes after the explosion. Israel bombed a hospital and killed 500 people. Now, when we heard that here in Israel, of course, we knew that was stupid because we don't bomb hospitals. And then as there was an investigation, by the way, 
How does Hamas know within 15 minutes that 500 people died? We still don't know exactly how many people died on October the 7th, but they knew in fifth, because they're smarter than we are, obviously, but they knew within 15 minutes that Israel had killed 500 people. Turns out it was more like 50 people, and it turns out it wasn't us at all. It, 20% of their bombs, 20% of their rockets, we're talking 2,000 rockets have landed in Gaza. In fact, they killed more people in that strike than they've ever actually killed in a strike in Israel. Their greatest victory, listen to me, in, in their entire career of launching rockets, their greatest victory was against their own people in a hospital parking lot. That's what you're defending, South Africa. So they also fire on these humanitarian corridors killing their own people. Uh, they, it, w there are also credible reports of people uh, testifying in Arabic that Hamas has uh, threatened them, taken their identity cars, cards, taken their car keys, taken and, and shot at their feet when they've attempted to move to safe areas. In other words, they're saying, no, you do not. It is your responsibility to stay in this building and die for the cause of the revolution uh, instead to go save you and your family. That, that's sick that they, they don't, again, leadership protects those under its leadership. Follow me, follow me is the ethos of the Israeli army commanders going first. The, 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 those of lesser ranks follow them into battle. Hamas different. We will shoot you if you run to for shelter. Okay. Number 12. Israel gave Palestinians advance notice to relocate three weeks before we even started our bombing campaign or, or the ground invasion. Three weeks before they were under attack, we said, this is where you need to go. In fact, there was a map that you'll see when you, if you watch the, the, the defense from today that has all these numbered corridors all over to Gaza and Israel has worked. They've got a website set up. They got a Twitter page set up. They get, you know, leaflets, phone calls, webs, everything you can imagine to say, here's where you're safe. Again, would Hamas even think of doing that for Israel? Um, number 13. A lot has been made of statements that have been made in Israel regarding the people of Gaza. And some of those statements I personally find uh, objectionable. They're not statements I make as a believer in Yeshua. I believe all people are made in the image of God. I'm praying for the people of Gaza. We want to, it, we're looking for ways to support uh, innocent people who've been injured. We love them. We care for them. But I remember 9-11. I remember the days I was in America. I lived, still lived in America. It was two years before we moved here. I remember the things that were said about Islam, about Arabs, about the French. We, we, we outlawed the word French fries and French toast. What was it called? Freedom fries. You know, there were a lot of in that. When you are, 3,000 people died on 9-11. The Twin Towers were destroyed. It was the worst terrorist attack in America's history. They targeted the White House. They, they killed people in the Pentagon. So yeah, you say stupid stuff when you're angry and upset and people have died. You want, you want to get even. You want revenge. That is human nature. So yeah, people here have said things. That doesn't make it Israeli policy. So if you're able to take something off Twitter and say, well, look what this guy said. It doesn't make it Israeli policy. Israeli policy is not genocide. Israeli, pol Israeli policy is not to re relocate the people of Gaza to other nations. Israeli policy is two primary goals. Destroy Hamas, bring our hostages back. Bring our hostages back, destroy Hamas. That's it. We would be thrilled if there was a righteous or even a semi-righteous government in Gaza that, that, that cared about the people of Gaza. We would work with them to rehabilitate their entire society. We would help them. We would be their friendly neighbor. We have offered them peace. Every Arab nation since 1948, since 1967, since they war, we're, since 1970, we're constantly offering peace. And let's not frame this thing as Israel and the Palestinians. It's Israel and the Arab world. By the way, many in the Arab world in the past few years have said, you know what? 
we, we, this nation is, is kind of rocking it, you know, when it comes to technology and security and farming, agriculture, we should be their friends. And they started saying, and they said, the pro, listen, th listen, I know this because I'm not dumb. <laughs> I know this. It used to be the attitude of the Arab world was, we will make peace with Israel once the Palestinian issue is solved. But a lot of these nations, they realize that the problem with the Palestinian issue has nothing to do with Israel. It has to do with the Palestinian leadership. You have the PA that steals from their people and all have gotten rich. And you have Hamas who are fanatic, uh, Islamic fanatics. So the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, long ago Jordan and Egypt, they made peace with Israel. Because they realized there was more to gain from having peace with Israel than waiting for the Palestinians. Palestinians have been offered to stay. In 1999, Ehud Barak offered Yasser Arafat ha half of Jerusalem in 97% of the West Bank. And he said, no, I'm going to go home and start a war instead. And that's what happened. That unleashed the greatest wave of, of suicide bombing and terrorism. You know, wedding halls exploding, buses exploding, restaurants exploding. They could have had a state. But you know what? I've said this many times. Governing is hard. Oh, my goodness. I, you know, I would not want to be the prime minister of Israel, the president of the United States. That's a lot of pressure. It's a whole lot easier to steal from your people and live like a millionaire and not worry about infrastructure and not care about your people. That is what Arafat did. He died with, and, and again, the Hamas guys are richer than him. We thought it was a lot of money back then. But when he died, when did he die? 2004, five, he died with $900 million in his personal bank account. No, he did not have a pizza chain called Arafat's. By the way, the best hummus in Jerusalem is called Arafat's. And it is, oh, but just, ah! If, if I was a racist, if we were racist, who do you think goes and eats at the Arabic, Arab owned Arafat pizza? And it's not owned by anybody related to Yasser Arafat. It's owned by, it, that, that is a name in the, it's, he's not the only one. It's like Adolf. Not many, nobody names her kid Adolf anymore. But but before Adolf Hitler, in fact, I, there were Jewish people that there was a famous jewel, jewelers in Richmond, Virginia, where I grew up called Adolf's jewel, Jewelers, owned by Jewish people. Because I think you get my point. Best hummus in Jerusalem, Arafat. It's in the old city, owned by Arabs. Why did Jews go there? Because we're not we're not racist. We're not there. There is no apartheid. I, I was watching this video today. I want I, um, Tamir Greenberg. He is a Israeli singer who won uh, one of our reality competitions a few years ago, uh, and he did a rendition of uh, um, Leonard Cohen's "Hallelujah." with an Arab girl. Can you believe that? In, in apartheid Israel, where apartheid means separation, where Jews and Arabs are separated and we hate each other, uh, in front of the whole country, on a reality... Wait a minute, how did an Arab girl get on a reality TV show in Israel if there's apartheid? Maybe there's not apartheid. Maybe that was a, a lie yesterday from the South Af African uh, uh, apologist for Hamas. Uh, no, you've got a, a Jewish young man and an Arab girl from Jaffa, Yafo, and they're singing together. What does hallelujah mean? It is a command. And it, it's a, it, you're, speak, you're saying you in the plural, praise Yahweh. So you've got a Arab, I think she was Christian, Arab Christian girl, an Israeli Jewish boy singing together, telling everybody listening, praise Yahweh. Praise everybody, praise Yahweh. Apartheid? Okay, I, I'm getting away. You can Google that, by the way. If you want to know, um, the, his name is Tamir uh, Greenberg. Let's see if I can find it. Um, let's go to the YouTube, the YouTuber. And um, Tamir Green. Hallelujah. There it is. And so if you just, yeah, if you just put that in there, Tamir Greenberg, hallelujah, you will see a beautiful rendition between him and Valerie um, Khamati. I'm sure I'm butchering her last name. Khamati. Khamati. Valerie Khamati. 
uh, a beautiful Arab girl from Jaffa and him singing. I mean, it'll, you're going to cry. You'll cry. Um, so there you go. We have, uh, I think, two more points, and then I'm going to let you go. Okay, lastly, uh, or two more points. <laughs> Number 14, for the ICSJ, International Court of Supposed Justice, to hold Israel responsible for what's going on in Gaza right now is a dog whistle to terrorist organizations all over the world. Here is the blueprint to get away with mass murder. What you do is you attack a country, and then they, when they respond to you, you cry genocide. If the ICSJ holds is a response, that's what they're doing. And you know what? Let me just say something. What you sow, you will reap. And I've seen this when it comes to terrorism. Because if you go back to the late 90s and early 2000s, where was their terrorism? Where were buses and wedding hall? I've already told you, you you're smart people. You know the answer. Israel. It happened in Israel. But you know what? After the world tolerated it, the primary place that these explosions began to happen, Iraq. One just happened the other day in Iran by ISIS, right? They killed over 100 people. Um, it began to happen all over the Middle East. It doesn't really happen here anymore. I mean, we had the worst terrorist attack ever on October 7th, and, and hopefully our government will get to the, to the reasons how we allowed that to happen. But, but the idea of buses blowing up and, and restaurants, it just hasn't happened in so many. When I moved here, it was a regular occurrence in Tel Aviv. My, my cousin, Daniel Cantor Waltz, was killed in a terrorist attack in Passover 2006. He walked with his father into a, a falafel sh uh, shawarma shop. Uh, they wanted a sandwich right before Passover. And because uh, you can't eat bread after sundown on Passover for a week, and a terrorist blew that blew himself up, killed my cousin. That used to happen all the time. It doesn't happen anymore. But it happens in Iraq. It happens in Syria. It happens all over the Middle East and in other countries. Because when you judge Israel disproportionately, you're bringing that back on yourself. And 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 you, you say, Ron, that's not in the Bible. Well, first of all, I just quoted Galatians six, which you reap, you sow which you sow, you reap. But let's go back to the story of uh, Hezekiah and Sennacherib. Sennacherib was the, um, was the king of Assyria. And the Bible says that God used him as a hammer to bring judgment on Israel. We, we were disobedient and God used Assyria to judge us, but he went too far in his arrogance. And then in one day, 100,000 of them died and God gave victory to Israel over them because of his arrogance towards Israel. In the same way, again, I'm not prophesying this. I'm saying it's a biblical principle. You got a problem with it? Take it up with God, not me. But th this is what South Africa is inviting on themselves for this double standard for ignoring. Again, if they had said yesterday, if they had come before the court yesterday and they said, you know what? We understand that what happened October 7th was horrendous. It, it just the worst crimes ever. And we understand how the people of Israel must feel. We just feel that they're going too far in their response. And let, let's, let's, here's exactly what Hamas did and here's exactly what Israel is doing and, and still disagree with us, that would be one thing. But they ignored almost completely the atrocities that Hamas committed against Israel and what they commit against Israel. In fact, they didn't... Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They did not even mention Hamas killing their own people. They did not even mention Hamas hiding in tunnels, using their people, hospitals, schools as human shields. They did not even mention the missiles and rockets found in schools and in nurseries. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Didn't even mention it, which makes it hypocrisy, which makes it dishonest. You see, the difference is when you're on a defense team, you come on, you watch Law and Order probably the greatest TV show ever. Um, like, I don't know if you watch all of her, but I watch it so much that like, I know like when in a court, like I, he's going to object, he's going to do that. And not because I'm smart, not because I went to law school. I watch Law and Order. The defense team will use whatever means they need to, to defend their client, even if they think their client's guilty. 
But the prosecution is supposed to be honest. They're supposed to genuinely believe in their case against the accused. In this case, the prosecution brought a dishonest case against Israel where they ignored facts, things that you and I have seen. I've seen the pictures. I've seen the videos. I watched two, three Hamas people shoot an Israeli man in front of his children and then grab the children and take them into the kitchen while he looks in the refrigerator for something to eat. I saw that with my own two eyes in the video. So it's reprehensible what South Africa has done. And they have invited judgment on the entire nation of South Africa. By the way, you say, well, no, not everybody. That, that's how it works. Go read the Bible. When leaders sin, sometimes God judges the whole nation. And I, 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 I mean, that goes for me and my nation as well, both America and Israel, for every nation. Leaders have that responsibility to bring blessing or to bring God's judgment. So be careful, South Africa, and be careful, ICSJ, how you rule tomorrow. Because again, I'm not prophesying to you, but I kind of am because this is the Bible. When you use unequal weights and measures, you invite judgment upon yourself. When you judge honestly, you invite the blessing of God on yourself. Read the book of Proverbs. It's all throughout Proverbs. And there are people that are going to make a judgment. I don't know when they, when they uh, decide. I said tomorrow, but I don't know. There are people on that uh, panel that, that they went into that knowing how they would vote. They were already told by their governments, you're going to vote against Israel. Do you understand that? The, the deck is already stacked. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, man. I'm just getting, I, I don't know why, but I feel the joy of the Lord right now because I know that the more that they are against us, that, that, that God is, is for us. Excuse me just for a second. Hmm. A policeman is calling me up. I will have to call him back later. I have no idea who that is, but it said Shotel. Uh, policeman. Maybe he's upset um, about what I'm saying, but probably not. He's probably encouraging me. Okay. I feel the joy of the Lord right now because, listen, we're not a perfect nation. I, I, I could tell you the problems in this nation, and I have been vocal about my disagreements with the government when I disagreed. I'm not afraid to do that. I am not. Somebody says Israel can do no wrong. We're not a perfect nation. I lived in Tel Aviv for 20 years. I, I, I've, and, and I mean, both the religious and the secular, I can tell you the problems. But when we are unfairly judged, just like in Hezekiah's day, when they were unfairly attacked, God Almighty defended them. And I just feel that prophetically right now. I just feel the presence of God right now, that God is going to defend Israel. And may he open our eyes. May we see him. May we understand him. May we love him. May we know him. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. I really wasn't. Um, but I do have one more point. Number 15. And I already said it. It was about, the, uh, it was about apartheid and the, the fact that we had... Uh, comp I'm looking at it right now. And I would turn the screen around, uh, if I could, of the uh, Jewish, Jewish young man, Tamir Greenberg, in Valermi Chama'ati, uh, the Arab girl singing together, hallelujah. That was my last point. Hallelujah. Friends, pray for Israel. Pray for us. I haven't felt joy in, in a while. It's been rough. It's been a battle. Um, and I'm just, just that God is touching me right now is, is I just, uh, I'm grateful. I'm blessed. And, um, well, praise the Lord. I just feel this reassurance, uh, that the, the, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with the people of Israel. So listen, God bless you all. Let's just pray right now. I just want to pray right now. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we just ask for your blessing on the nation of Israel. I pray that where we need to repent, we would repent. But I pray, Lord God, that in, in the greater scope of world history and the nations against Israel, that you would be our defender in the name of Yeshua. I pray, O oh God, for our government, for our leaders, for um, our Supreme Court, our, our, our 
Knesset, God, that your blessing would be upon this nation in the name of Yeshua. And that as Shabbat comes in, that your blessing would be upon every family in Israel, God. And Lord God, they don't know what, what I know. They don't, there's so many of them, they don't know you. They don't have a relationship with you, God. And I pray that you would fill them with that assurance, with that joy, and, and give them a revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. Lord God, that they would know you and you would make yourself known to them in Yeshua's name. Shabbat Shalom. God bless you guys, and um, we'll see what happens in the International uh, uh, Court of, hang on, there we go, International Court of Supposed Justice. Shalom.